I look like everyone is here. So we're happy to have uh, Wojtek Samoti from Tel Aviv University, uh, who will tell us about uh, containers. Hey, hi. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you uh, for the invitation. So uh, today I have two hours to uh, to talk to you, and I kind of I will break these two hours into two parts. In the first uh, hour, I will give kind of a self-contained and hopefully well-motivated uh, problem that I will show you how to solve using this container method. And in the second part, I'll tell you a bit more about the abstract method. And I'll show you kind of a very detailed sketch of a proof of a container lemma, uh, which uh, was recently found by Marcelo Campos uh, and myself. So this is, uh, this is the plan for today. Now, I'll start with something that I'm sure all of you know, is that whenever you color, or however you color the edges of the complete graph on six vertices into two colors, one of the color classes needs to contain a triangle. This is kind of the basic non-trivial case of Ramsey's theory. And uh, let me introduce some notation. We will write that a graph G arrows another graph, but in our case, it will always be the triangle, if and only if, However, you color the edges, uh, sorry, of, of the graph G with colors one and two, uh, one of the color classes will contain a triangle. Of course, I can write any other graph other than triangle, but the triangle will be our running example. So this kind of famous riddle or a first result in Ramsey theory that if you see is that K6 has this property, however you color, two color the edges of complete graph on six vertices, you always see a triangle. Now, uh, while studying this problem, people kind of were interested in, in understanding whether for a graph to arrow the triangle, it necessarily has to contain a complete graph on six vertices. And kind of a, a natural question, uh, that appears is, is there, does there exist a, a graph G uh, without the K6, however, such that when you two color its edges, you will still always, still always see a monochromatic triangle. Now, if you forbid a K6, then why not forbid a K5? And if you forbid a K5, why not forbid a K4? If you forbid a K4, why not forbid a K3? Of course, forbidding K3 doesn't make any sense because we're looking for a monochromatic K3. So I guess the best or the strongest thing we can ask about <laughs> is whether there exists a graph G without a complete subgraph on four vertices, however, such that, uh, however you two color its edges, you will always see a triangle. Or in other words, does there exist a K4 free graph G that cannot be decomposed into two triangle free graphs. And now in 1960s, there was a conjecture of Erdes and Heinlein, so I think 1967, they conjectured that there is nothing, conjecture kind of a strong version of this question, namely, for every integer r, at least three, uh, there exists a graph G, which doesn't contain a complete subgraph on r plus one vertices. However, G cannot be decomposed into two graphs which don't, don't contain a kr. And as so some history, I will not write everything on the board, but I'll, I'll tell you anyway, it's, there's kind of some money, serious money in this, in this problem. In the, 19, in the year 1970, Folkman proved uh, this conjecture, and in, but the graph he constructed was, was enormous because in 1975, Paul Erdes offered $100 for a construction of such a graph that has at most 10 to the 10, so 10 billion vertices. In 1986, Frankel and Riddle proved 
that there exists such a graph with 70 billion. You mean for R equals three? For R equals three, yes. 70 billion vertices. So almost there. And finally, in 1988, Spencer constructed a graph with 3 billion vertices that has this property. So for, for K4 and for K3. Uh, then in the 1990, Edgar said, okay, I'll give another $100 for a graph with at most a million vertices. And this waited until 2008, a Lincoln Lu constructed a graph with slightly less than 10,000 vertices. So he collected the $100 and the current world record is 786. This is Lange, Radishovsky, and, and Shu. And Ron Graham in 2012 offered another $100 for a graph with at most 100 vertices, which has the property. And so this is still open. So maybe not the easiest way to make 100 bucks, but, uh, but it's one way. Now, what I'm uh, going to do in the first part of the talk is to give you kind of a modern proof of this fact. We won't get down to uh, that certainly 100 vertices that I wouldn't share the solution with you, uh, but perhaps in the order of, of Spencer, so about a billion vertices. However, I didn't kind of do the calculations. <clears throat> uh, so we want to give an explicit bound, but we'll show at least that such a graph exists. So this talk, It's a modern uh, proof of of this conjecture. In fact, as you will see, the solution will be kind of good for any R, but just to keep the presentation simple, I'll, I'll focus, restrict to the case R equals three. And kind of for those of you, you who are interested in know a little extremal graph theory, then you'll be able to easily generalize it to any R. Now, what was the uh, idea in the work of uh, Franklin and Riddle and later Spencer, how to approach this problem? Uh, their idea was to take G from, uh, to, to be a random graph from some distribution and kind of estimate the probabilities that the graph can be decomposed into two triangle free graphs and on the other hand, the probability that it doesn't contain a K4. So if the probability that it doesn't contain a K4 is greater than the probability that it can be decomposed into two triangle free graphs, then we have, uh, we have our graph. Now, the exact uh, result whose proof I'll try to present is the following. Uh, suppose that the edge probability P tends to zero slower than log N over root N. And what we're interested in is the probability that the random graph were G and P, so N vertices, each edge appears independently with probability P, and P is a function of N tending to zero, but not, uh, not very fast. We want to estimate the probability that this graph doesn't arrow K3, meaning what's the probability that G and P can be decomposed into two triangle free graphs? And the bound uh, that we will get is this is exponential in a constant times N squared P. So kind of this is the smallest probability we can expect here because E2 Another constant n squared p is the probability that the graph is empty. So if it doesn't arrow k3, somehow the idea is that it's extremely unlikely the graph needs to lack a lot of edges. Or the edges have to be distributed in kind of very non-uniform way. Now, how is it related to this problem? So let's have a corollary. The corollary is that there exists a graph without a K4 uh, that arrows K3. So here's a proof of this fact. Uh, let's take the probability P 
to be in the range where, where our theorem applies. However, we want to keep the density not too high so that the probability of avoiding a K4 is not very, very small. So this happens to be function n to minus 2 over 5. This is the, the density at which the expected number of copies of a K4 is of the same order of magnitude as the expected number of edges. So most edges do not participate in a K4. Now, how can you estimate the probability that a complete graph on four vertices is not a subgraph of GNP? If, so the K4 has six edges, so any given copy of K4 will be avoided with probability at one minus P to the six. And there are n choose four ways to choose the location of it. And if these events were mutually independent, this would be precisely the probability. So for each of them, it's one minus P to the six, and we have n choose four uh, such copies. Now, of course, these events are not independent. However, they are positively correlated because they're all decreasing events. And there's a fairly well-known inequality in probability theory, also in combinatorial, it's called Harris's inequality, or its generalization, the FKG inequality, which shows that for events which are positively correlated, we can lower bound this, the probability of the intersection by the product of the probability. So we get a bound which is at least as good as if these events were independent. So this is by Harris's inequality. Or its generalization and kind of better known inequality, the FKG. Okay, what is the order of magnitude of that? This is exponential in n to the four, p to the six. However, the probability that we can be decomposed into two triangle free graphs is like e to n squared p. And under our assumption on p, this probability is much, much greater, so even though the probability of being K for free is exponentially small. It's exponentially small in some polynomial, which is smaller than N squared P, and therefore kind of conditioned on not having K4, we're still extremely unlikely to, to be decomposable into two triangle free graphs. So kind of this probabilistic proof is maybe somewhat unusual in the sense that we don't prove that something happens with high probability, we prove that it happens to actually with very small probability because this bound is, is, is pretty good. However, it's good enough because the probability of the other bad event is, is even much, much smaller. Okay, are there any questions about, about that? Also, please feel free to, to interrupt me if, if something is unclear, we have uh, plenty of time. Is there a way to ask for explicit construction of such graphs? Yes. So I, I believe that the original construction of Folkman was explicit. I see. But all the uh, all the constructions, at least that I'm aware of, that followed, I uh, use some uh, some probability. Okay. So, how do you prove the proposition? Now, uh, let's start with this important observation that kind of I've already said, uh, that the fact or the statement G doesn't, yes, what? Is there an obvious uh, reason for the one over root 10? Uh, yes. So it kind of, it would be, it would be clear. maybe more clear from the proof. It's, it, the this event kind of one thinks of it as a global event and uh, one over root n is the density at which a typical edge is covered by a triangle so kind of it's 
the only thing that matters here are the edges that live on triangles because the other ones you can you could color any way you want without risking to create or not create a monochromatic triangle. So it's only about the edges that are in triangles. And at this density, this is precisely where a typical edge is in a triangle. So actually you can show, although it's not very easy that if you reverse this inequality and re remove this log n, then uh, kind of the opposite is true, that typically you can decompose G and P into two triangle free graphs. In fact, there are no triangles. In there are, but just fewer triangles than edges. So G not arrow in K3, this means that you can decompose or cover G with two graphs uh, such that both G1 and G2 uh, are triangle-free. They do not contain a triangle. Uh, now, uh, let me introduce uh, the following notation for it. F sub n of K3, so n stands for the number of vertices, F is, stands for free, and K3 is K3. So these are graphs that are free of K3 and have n vertices. So this will be all the subgraphs of the complete graph on n vertices that don't contain a triangle. And I could rewrite a this observation as follows. There exist two triangle free graphs on n vertices that cover the, the graph G. Now, how does looking at these things help us to, uh, to attack uh, this problem? Uh, now, if the random graph can be decomposed into two triangle free graphs, then it could be covered by some two triangle free graphs. And let's at least analyze the probability given two triangle free graphs, fixed pair of triangle free graphs, what is the probability that the edge GNP is covered by their union? So uh, this will be some first try given some G1 and G2, which are triangle free graphs. What can you say about the probability that the random graph G and P is covered by their union? Well, it means that it has no edges outside of the union. So it has no edges. Outside of the union of these two graphs. Now, why would we have any good bound on the number of edges in the union of two triangle free graphs? Uh, the answer is that K6 cannot be decomposed into two triangle free graphs because of Ramsey's theorem. So this graph, if we take a union of two triangle free graphs, then it will not contain a complete graph on six vertices. So this graph has no K6. And if you've ever heard a Turan's theorem, then what can you say about a graph without a K6? It can only have about four fifths of the edges uh, that the complete graph has. So therefore, the number of edges in the union is at most about four fifths of n choose two. So for any fixed pair of triangle free graphs, 
we get a kind of a decent bound, one minus P to N choose two P over five, where this is E two minus N squared P over 10. So it's kind of, it's a bound of this form that we're looking for. However, it's only good for a fixed pair of triangle free graphs and there's quite a lot of triangle free graphs. Uh, there's no P in the exponent, one minus P to the power of four. Ah, sorry, 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 and, and choose two, th thanks though. Uh, sorry, sorry, I got ahead of myself. So uh, yes, N choose two uh, over five, and then it's E two minus N squared P over 10 roughly. Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of the issue with this argument is that uh, if we were now to union bound over our G1 and G2, this would be an enormous union bound uh, because the number of triangle free graphs on the vertices well, it's at least two to the n squared over four. You can take any fixed complete bipartite graph. It has n squared over four edges and each of its subgraphs is triangle three. So kind of the union bound is, is, is no good. And kind of the idea behind this a container method is how to deal with such big union bound to rescue our, these kind of simple-minded arguments uh, in a, a wide variety of scenarios and kind of this uh, problem of being able to decompose or not being able to decompose a graph into two triangle free graphs is, is just one of uh, one of the examples. So the example you gave though you really only care about the maximum graph, right? And not the subject. Uh, great, yeah, this is a great, uh, great observation. It's also true that the number of maximal triangle free graphs is quadratic in N. Hmm. So kind of the construction of a large family of maximal triangle free graphs would be, you again take a, a, some bipartition and on one of the sides, you add a perfect matching, and then you add the edges here conditioned on kind of a random type of condition on not closing a triangle with any of these edges. And this leads to, to a family, I think, of size roughly two to the n squared over eight. So you are absolutely right. It's enough to consider maximal triangle free graphs, but it's still a very, very large family. Okay, so the, the kind of question is how to get rid of, uh, of this large union bound. And here's, here's the solution. Uh, let me call it a key lemma, uh, which is a corollary of kind of a much more general theorem uh, that was proved by uh, Yoshi Balog, uh, Rob Morris, and myself and independently by David Saxton and Andrew Thomason. Uh, this is in 2015. So I'll only state here the, this specific kind of corollary of this result, which, uh, which applies to, to the setting of triangle free graphs. So there's a lot of triangle free graphs, and also there's a lot of maximal triangle free graphs. So how do we capture uh, all triangle free graphs using smaller number of, uh, of graphs. And the idea is to relax the notion of triangle free and cover by things that are nearly triangle free. So the statement says, given a positive epsilon, there exists a constant k epsilon and a family c, which also depends on epsilon. This is a family 
of graphs on n vertices, which has the following three properties. First, uh, its size is exponential, not in n squared, but in n to three halves log n. So much, much smaller family. A two, <coughs> it still covers a all triangle free graphs in the sense that every triangle free graph on n vertices has a graph in the family that covers its edge set. So know that kind of these two items don't say anything. I could just take C to contain the complete graph, much better bound. Still, this is true. But the important thing is that this covering is, is tight or almost tight in the sense that we're covering the triangle free graph by something that is essentially triangle free. And this is where the epsilon comes from. Uh, so for every covering graph in the family, uh, C contains uh, at most epsilon and choose three triangles. And I have a comment here, why not maximum triangle free graph, but we've already discussed it. So it wouldn't, we can't cover by really triangle free graphs because there's too many maximal ones. However, we can cover with graphs which have, so n choose three is the number of triangles in the complete graph. We can take any epsilon proportion and uh, we'll be able to construct such a family. So both two and three are easy to satisfy by the family of maximal. One and three are also easy to satisfy. We can take just the complete graph, but kind of the point is that you can have one and two and three uh, holding simultaneously. And three halves is the correct power. And three halves is the correct power. So you, this family cannot be uh, any smaller. So let me let me show you how to uh, how to use it, uh, how to use this key lemma to to prove the proposition. So how does the key lemma imply uh, this proposition? And this argument is due to uh, Raiko Nenadov and uh, Angelika Steg. So it goes like this. What's the probability that G and P does not arrow K3? As we said, it, it means that G and P can be decomposed into two triangle free graphs. So this is the probability that there are graphs G1 and G2, which are triangle free, uh, such that a G and P is contained in their union. Now, G1 has some containing graph and G2 also has its own containing graph. So we fix some epsilon, which, which will be chosen later and we get this family C epsilon. So this is at most the probability that there are two covering graphs, C1 and C2, in the family C epsilon, such that G and P <clears throat> is contained in their union. Okay, union bound was no good here, but here the union bound will be over much, much smaller family. So this is at most the sum 
now C1, C2, and the thumb is C epsilon. And as we said, this is one <coughs> minus P to the power and choose two minus the number of edges in C1 minus C2. So the C1 union C2. And this is at most the size of the family squared times E to minus P and choose two minus the maximum possible union the number of edges in a union of two graphs which are not now not triangle free but nearly triangle free so kind of to make it work we just need to say that this is divided by interest two this is bounded away from one and kind of this, this will be the next lemma or actually a claim. <coughs> is uh, if we take two any two graphs which have each of them at most epsilon and choose three triangles, uh, then the number of edges in their union can be bounded from above by uh, one minus essentially one over six choose two times n choose two, but I have to pay something. And this is two, six choose three times epsilon. This is not the best possible bound, but this bound has the easiest proof that, that I know of. So the truth should be, in fact, something uh, close to there. It, it, I could prove such a bound, but this one has a kind of much more self-contained proof. Yes, is a triangle removal lemma? That's the the, the, proof, the proof of this bound would be to say since uh, the union, so since this graph doesn't have too many uh, triangles, then the union of these two graphs cannot have too many K6s. Because in each K6 you would and then you would use super saturation for uh, for to run. Uh, but quite likely, there's also a proof which you would use Semeredi's lemma and the triangle removal lemma. But let's prove a weaker bound that is anyway. Uh, so, kind of, if you want to, uh, so I'm not sure what the dependence you get from the proof. If you wanted to optimize your chances of getting a hundred dollars, then you should probably kind of aim for uh, for the other bound. So here's here's a proof of this fact. It's kind of a, a a simple averaging argument. Uh, let's denote our graph the union by G. So G is a union of two graphs. Each of them has only an epsilon proportion of all the triangles. And uh, let's choose a set R. It's a set of six vertices uniformly at random. So we choose a random set of six vertices of G. And kind of the idea is, here's our graph G, the vertex set is N, and we kind of zoom in on what ha is happening in on randomly chosen six vertices. Now, what is the number of edges induced by G in this set? I claim that it's at most six choose two minus one. And the only exception would be if one of these graphs, either C1 or C2 had a triangle there. And because if none of them had a triangle, then this would contradict the fact that K6 arrows K3, I cannot see all the edges on six vertices and no triangles in the union of these two graphs. So this is at most six choose two minus one, unless there's either a triangle in C1, and 
or there is a triangle in C2. So normally we should see this, and if we don't, then it means there must be a triangle either here or there. So what do we do now? We take expectations. So let's take <laughs> expectation. Now, G has this many edges. Each of the edges is equally likely to appear uh, in this window of R. And this window sees six choose two edges out of N choose two. This is a constant. And the same goes for triangles. Each triangle of C1 has the same chance to appear in the window, and the window sees 6 choose 3 out of n choose 3. So this is the number of triangles. C1 plus the number of triangles. And C2 times 6 choose 3 divided by n choose 3, but this is at most epsilon n choose 3, and this is at most epsilon n choose 3. The n choose 3s cancel, and we get 6 choose 2 minus 1 plus 2, 6 choose 3 epsilon, and this is precisely the bound. Uh, that I claimed there. Okay, and so now we can plug this in here. And I'm sorry for uh, for the board work. I just ran out of a little space to finish. So let me denote this by star. How do we finish? We were promised that the size is exponential k epsilon n to three halves log n. So this is at most uh, exponential in two k epsilon n to three halves log n. And here, if we take epsilon sufficiently small, then we get say one minus one over two six choose two, which saves us a and n choose 2p over, say, 2, 6 choose 2. And sure enough, if p is greater, greater than log n over square root of n, this term beats that term. And we get, say, n choose 2p divided by 3. 6 to 2, so that's some explicit constant uh, for the little c. Exponential negative that? Uh, uh, yes, you're. This one, of course, also true, but not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so perhaps uh, this would be almost a good time to stop. Let me just maybe add uh, one more comment. Uh, pro probably many of you know Mantel's theorem. We, we mentioned Turan's theorem. So kind of the same proof method. Mantel's theorem says the largest triangle-free subgraph of Kn has roughly half the edges. So kind of the same method can be used to prove that <clears throat> under this assumption on P, the largest triangle-free subgraph of the random graph G and P also has at most uh, slightly more than half, half the edges. So kind of if, if you're looking for uh, kind of to, to try to use this argument for something else, this would be maybe a good place, uh, place to start. And yes, let, me, uh, let me stop here. Just a question before, before we stop. Sure. Does this say something uh, concrete about the structure of the maximal uh, yes. uh, uh, triangle free graphs? Y yes. You could also, for example, if you analyze this argument more carefully, uh, you could deduce that on the exponentially unlikely event that 
the graph GNP can be decomposed into two triangle free graphs that is close to a blow up of K5. For this, you would have to kind of get the bound that you suggested. And in this union bound, kind of the only pairs that really matter are the ones with the smallest union. And kind of using some stability arguments, you would have to show that if you do get close to four fifths and choose two, then you have to look like a blow up of, of a K5. Otherwise, you would have many K6s and, and you would have uh, more triangles. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, we can take maybe 10 minutes and I'll say something in the second part about the general method and, and kind of how to prove, uh, prove this thing. Okay, so uh, in the second part now, I'm going to tell you something about kind of the general statement. We had this key lemma and I said it's a special a case of something more general. So I'll explain why is it a special case of, of, of what more general statement. And kind of in the main part of the talk, I will sketch a proof of this more general statement that was recently found by Marcelo uh, Campos. Really a, a brilliant young mathematician. You might know him from, say, the exponential improvement on of the Ramsey numbers. And also he did some really great work on random matrices. So he's currently in Cambridge and will start a position in IMPA in Rio de Janeiro uh, next year. So uh, how should we look at triangle free graphs to prove things like this? Uh, kind of in this in this area, kind of these kinds of questions were very popular in combinatorics or probabilistic combinatorics since the 1990s, and kind of many theorems were proved. And there were two breakthrough works, one by, by David Conn and Tim Gowers, and the other by Matthias Schaff, and also had kind of a close related paper with uh, Edward Fieldwood and, and Wojta Riddle, that realized that actually these problems are best solved when abstracted properly. And here's the proper abstraction of, of these kinds of questions. How to look at triangle free graphs? Forget about the vertices, uh, because GNP is a collection of edges. So in fact, we should look at the edges of the complete graph. And what is a triangle? Triangle are just three edges that form a triangle. But let's forget that they're edges. These are just kind of some abstract elements and we marked certain triples of these elements to be important. These are the triangles. <coughs> and let's call this thing script H because this is a, a hypergraph. So kind of key idea, consider the uh, three uniform, meaning every hyper edge. I'll try to say hyper edge because we have the edges which are the hyper vertices and the triangles which are the hyper edges. Consider the three uniform hypergraph H uh, uh, whose vertex set or hyper vertex set is, are the edges of the complete graph and whose hyper edges are triples of edges. So UV, VW, UW, these are three edges that form a triangle and now U, V and W are the vertices of the complete graph, but this is, it's a collection, it's a triple of edges of the, of the complete graph. Now, what is a triangle-free graph in this language? A triangle-free graph is a collection of hypervertices, uh, no three of which form an edge. So triangle-free graphs are precisely the independent sets 
in this hypergraph. So triangle free graphs is the same as the independent sets in this hyper. And this kind of turns out to be the proper context or the proper level of abstraction to look at a kind of these questions we have some local forbidden configuration and we model this the set of the, such configurations as as hyper edges of some hypergraph and they call it the kind of the structures that avoid them are an independent set in this hypergraph so kind of what we're looking for is a way of efficient covering of the independent set of some auxiliary uniform hypergraph. And kind of we did it for, the spe I stated the spe special case for triangle free graphs, but I'll show you kind of now the general statement and maybe discuss it a bit more how, how it uh, recovers this key lemma. So I, I'm sorry, I'm going to move to this board so that I have a little more room. And in the case of two uniform hypergraphs, graphs is significantly easier. And uh, kind of there are works of Kleitman and Winston from, from the 80s that kind of prove such statements implicitly and maybe more explicitly by Alexander Sapozhenko from the 90s. And he also coined the term containers. Uh, but the kind of the, the first general, uh, the three uniform and three and higher uniformity case was uh, was first established by uh, Yoji Balog, Rob Morrison, and, and myself, and by Saxton and Thomason. This was about 2012. The papers appeared in 2015. So here is the statement. Given any uniformity and any positive epsilon, uh, there is a constant uh, K, which depends on R and an epsilon only, such that the following points. So the, the theorem as input uh, uh, gets some uh, R uniform hypergraph. Say R is equal to three and H is encodes triangles. So we get collection of triangles in the complete graph. Hypergraph on a finite vertex set V. And we have a parameter Q, something between zero and one. And I'll just Kind of note here that for, for the case of triangle free graphs, our Q would be one over root N if, if you want to kind of get some, uh, some estimate of, of the order of magnitude. So for every such Q, uh, there exists a collection uh, C of uh, what is usually called containers for uh, I of H, the independent sets of the hypergraph H, the independent sets of H, with the following three properties which should now look familiar. One, uh, the size of C is exponential in K, Q, size of V times log of one over Q. Two, uh, every independent set is contained, is a subset of one of the containers. 
and three, every, uh, each of these containers is what I will write here, epsilon Q close to being independent. Now, it's not kind of a, a formal statement. And in the case of triangle free graph, this epsilon Q closeness completely ignored Q, uh, but just said, okay, you have only an epsilon proportion of the triangles. And kind of the, the theorems that we proved here had some conditions on the degree sequences of the hypergraph, which were stated in terms of Q. And then we said that the final container contained at most an epsilon proportion of the edges of the hypergraph. And kind of what in, in this work with Marcelo, uh, we kind of naturally arrived at different notions of epsilon Q closeness that perhaps abstractly make more sense. And here's uh, the definition that I will use for the rest of the talk. Uh, in what sense are we epsilon Q close to being independent? Now, if C was really independent, uh, then it will be zero close to independent, but kind of the, the, the right notion here or the notion that kind of we're able to work with is the following. Take the elements of C and keep each one independently with probability Q. So this is a binomial random subset with density Q. And let's ask the question, what is the probability that when we randomly sparsify C, we get an independent set? And we want this probability not to be very small. And precisely, we want it to be you know, less than exponentially small in QV. So if you take a random subset, then kind of the condition says that with probability, which is kind of sub exponentially large in QV, you get an independent set. Now, how is it related to, to kind of to the notion of, of having few triangles? These two can be easily related using a kind of well-known concentration equalities, and namely the, the Janssen inequality. So Janssen's inequality, which is a well-known or relatively well-known inequality in probabilistic combinatorics, it's an inequality that gives an upper bound on this quantity for an arbitrary hypergraph, an arbitrary Q. Janssen's inequality would imply that if we take Q to be one over root N, then the fact that you're sub-exponentially likely to be independent would say that C contains at most some F of epsilon triangles, it, sorry, times N choose through triangles. Yes, I, I think I might have missed this. CQ is like uh, the edge wise, sorry, the vertex sparsification. I think you, you drop a vertex from each hyper edge. Like, what okay. So CQ, okay, what is CQ? It's it's just a product distribution on C. You keep okay. each hypervertex independently with probability Q. Okay. So in the context of triangle free graphs, thanks for the question. C is a subgraph of KN. Okay. So this is just, a, you keep each edge now with probability Q. Okay. Correct. And <clears throat> kind of the conclusion says that you're covering by graphs, which have the property that if you take a Q random subgraph, then you're quite likely not to have a triangle. Okay. 
And Janssen's inequality would imply that if you chose Q to be uh, one over square root of n, then you can't have more than some constant epsilon times n choose three triangles because if you had more, then this probability would have been smaller. In the previous application, the only thing you needed is that every C does not is not too large in this sense. Right. So is this implied by being epsilon Q? Yes. So suppose that actually there it was about, but say for the Turan question, you only care about the fact that it has not much more than half the edges of the complete graph. Now, if you take any graph, which is say 51%, then already it will contain a positive proportion of the triangles. This is, can be proved using a simple averaging argument. And the probability that you avoid all of these triangles is already exponentially small in Q n squared uh, as soon as Q is at least one over root n. In other applications, you need this stronger form. It's not enough to just say that. So it, we don't have any kind of new applications. So this theorem implies the old theorem <laughs> via Janssen's inequality. Uh, however, we kind of it's 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 new work. So this statement only appeared kind of a couple of months ago in, in this new work with Marcelo. Uh, so it implies it's kind of stro uh, stronger in the sense that it implies the previous one, and we don't see how the previous one implies that. And, and we believe kind of, this is a better way of looking at it because you don't need to assume anything about the hypergraph. And in, in the previous versions of the theorem, you had to say something about the degree sequence of H. Uh, I mean, if you just change this to every C is not too large. Um, so for certain applications, this would be sufficient, but for, for the Ramsey application, already not. Because say, we talk about triangle-free graphs and you can only prove that one such graph is at most 50% of the edges. But now the union of two, it could have all the edges. Okay. And you need uh, you need it to be kind of separated from one. Okay. So it, 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 maybe a better way of thinking, not too large, meaning not in terms of the number of hyper vertices, but rather in terms of the number of hyper edges. And then this would be sufficient. And kind of th this is at least intuitively clear that kind of the fewer hyper edges you, the more hyper edges, the less likely you are to uh, to satisfy this. But of course, it has to take into account their distribution because perhaps they're kind of all lean on a, on a tiny set, sublinear uh, set of vertices. It's enough not to uh, kind of to not to contain any such uh, such vertex. Okay, so let's uh, let me state the theorem, which is slightly stronger than this. That I will uh, I will actually now sketch uh, sketch the proof of, and this this is the theorem uh, that Marcelo and I proved recent. Uh, the preprint should be on archive, and as soon as I as I go back home and, and get to get to my routine. Uh, it's this kind of the um, general statement is the same, but it differs in some uh, some small technicalities. In particular, K is made explicit and the property of the family of containers is made a little bit stronger. I'll, I'll explain in what sense. So let H be a hypergraph a, on a finite vertex set D. Now, for all uh, reals at uh, zero at uh, P 
p between 0 and 1 and delta between p and 1. And I'm really sorry, the p and the q uh, play the same role. Uh, but somehow the proof in my head is written with p, and if I had to now uh, change to q, it would cause, uh, cause a mess. I, I wanted to write q here so that it's not confused with the p of the g and p, but say, clean context, uh, p, p is the q here. I, I, I apologize for that. Uh, so for all reals p and delta, uh, there is a family uh, S of subsets of V and uh, two functions. A function G, which given an independent set, produces an element of S and a function f, which for every element of s uh, produces a subset of the vertices. And each of the sets in s has at most pv over delta elements. So the number of the, the, so in particular, the size of S is at most V choose number of sets of size at most PV over delta. So this is the VP times log one over P coming from here. Two, for all I, We have G of I and F of G of I. And the set I lands in the middle. So the previous theorem doesn't have G defined implicitly. It just says we have a small family of, uh, of containers. However, for various technical reasons, it's convenient to index these containers by subset of the independent set. In particular, this allows to shave off log factors. So the theorem that they proved, if we use this version, we would be able to get rid of this log, uh, log n. Because in fact, kind of the union bound is not over all sets of a certain size, but over all subsets of, uh, of our random set, and we, we can shave off this log factor. And third, for every, S in S, letting C be this container which uh, which is associated with this given set S, the probability that S union CP is independent. is at least one minus P to delta, delta C. So CP, CP, ah, CP, right. Uh, uh, this is, the, again, the P random, yes, P random subset of C, but th thanks. We'll keep each element independently with probability P. <clears throat> Ah, sorry, here, I have to also uh, add the small set. So in fact, we get something slightly stronger because these elements we keep with probability one and these elements we keep with probability P and still the probability of being independent is kind of sub exponentially large. It's exponential in PC and delta we choose to be small. Now, uh, this S is supposed to stand for signatures, since every independent set has its signature, which is a small subset of it, and, and it's contained in some set, which depends only on the signature. And the set has the property that once you randomly sparsify it, 
it's quite likely to be independent. So in the sense, this covering is, is tight. The S, S are all independent too. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So kind of a picture would be if this is two to the V and kind of sets at which are independent, they form a down set and kind of they live over here. And now the family S, these are sets which are very, very small. And now every set which is independent is somehow mapped to, to some S. And then this S, it corresponds to some set F of S and I is kind of sandwiched in between S and F of S. But since we have very small, very small family of sets S, then the number of, of these covering sets is also small. And kind of it's, they're no longer independent, but they're kind of independent in, in, in this sense. But, but, so F of S doesn't have to contain S? Uh, well, you could kind of add the, the S uh, artificially later. Okay. I wrote it in this way because kind of this is how, uh, this is how the proofs work. But of course you could unite them and here we take all elements of S with probability one. So actually uh, this condition would imply the respective condition if C also contained S. It's it kind of, it's just a, a minor technicality because C will be of microscopic size, whereas you think of S as, as being very small. Any other questions? Maybe I'll, I'll give you a minute to, to digest. Yes. Uh, can you explain again how you shape up the long factor? Uh, yes. So let me kind of do it here. So you remember that we had some say, or some C1 and C2 in our collection for, for triangle three graphs. What is the probability uh, that a G and P is contained in C1 union C2. However, to even consider C1 and C2, there's sets covering some triangle free subgraphs of G and P. We would also have to say, hey, but to even consider it, you have to contain the union of S1 and S2, which are the, the signature sets that correspond to those two. So now instead of taking a union bound over this set C, you take a union bound over this set S. However, since they're contained, you get a factor of P to the S. So it's kind of a sum over all S, P to the S times something which is exponentially small. And now this union bound uh, is not exponential in, in kind of the largest size times logarithm, but, but rather just in the largest size. Okay, so how, kind of the question is how to construct such functions G and F. Now, maybe it's an algorithmic problem because the, cons the construction is indeed algorithmic. However, it's not, as, as far as I know, it's not an efficient uh, algorithm uh, because the algorithm will uh, need to use a lot of information that I think it's not computationally uh, tractable. So here's the proof. Uh, we'll describe an algorithm 
whose input is some independent set. Of course, there are parameters which are H, a P, and delta. And its output sets S and C such that S is between, so I is between S and C units. And this C and S have, have these properties. But importantly, C depends only on S in the sense that if I have two different inputs, which will give the same set S, they will also have to give the same set C. And this will guarantee the decomposition into these two functions. Also, C depends on I only through S. So all the information that we need to construct C from I we will put into the set, set S. And here's uh, how it goes. <clears throat> yes. You wrote only this condition, but you also mean that the and also the the uh, this condition that the set S is small, and also this this condition I just wanted to save uh, save space. Uh, so it's it's an iterative algorithm. First, H zero is H. We initialize with S MP, and there will be a set A which are a set of candidates for C, uh, kind of vertices, hypervertices that still could be in C, this would be this, the evolving set A. In the beginning, everyone's a candidate. And the main kind of loop of the algorithm is as follows. So do the following for I zero, one, two, uh, dot 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 we uh, will consider to add certain elements of i to the set s to the set kind of that will describe the container uh, and we would like to take their vertices that will give us the most information about i Somehow we want to concentrate the information about I into small sets. So we want to take the vertices which will improve our understanding of I, given that I contains these vertices. And uh, the question that we're going to ask is the following, whether there exists, if there exists a vertex V, which is in AI, with the following property. Consider the probability that the vertex V belongs to a P random subset of AI. So this is the current set of candidates, given that this set is independent. So we take a P random subset of AI and condition it on being independent. So I know at least several people in the room that will recognize this as being the hardcore model, uh, the hypergraph hardcore model on AI. So we kind of sample a weighted independent set of, of, uh, of, uh, of H induced by AI. And we ask, what is the probability that V will appear there? Some vertices, for some vertices, the probability might be zero already, and namely because the, our graph is, hypergraph is evolving. So these are not interesting. We don't learn anything from them. So first we will require that this probability is positive. And on the other hand, uh, we're interested in vertices for which this probability is less than one minus delta times P. 
So Harris's inequality implies that for every vertex, this probability is at most P to appear in a sample from the hardcore model. And we're interested in vertices that have significantly smaller probability to appear, one minus delta times P, but still not zero because otherwise, uh, there's just no independent set given what we've done so far. Where is I used? The I is here. No, capital I. Capital I. Ah, not yet. This is just, it's kind of a, an if statement. And now we will check whether or not V is actually in our set I. So this is the kind of the choice for, for this, for the, this, which decision to, to make now. So you don't start with A equals I for, there's a good reason. No, A is everything in the beginning. So in the first step of the algorithm, you will just sample a random independent set from, from this hardcore distribution, and you will find some vertex whose probability of appearance is non-zero, but less than uh, what it would be if H was empty. So, so in some sense, this V is supposed to be more informative than average? Then, uh, yes, yes, yes. The, the, these V, as you will see, they're more informative. And so if such ex vertex exists, let VI be some such vertex. Otherwise, uh, you, you stop, meaning whatever you see in, uh, in SI will be your S and uh, so we, we'll, I'll have kind of the summarizing uh, line at the end. And also, uh, J is the last index I that we considered. Uh, so here's two possibilities. Uh, so as Jose asked, I mean, we have to relate it to I. So we ask if whether or not VI is in I, that our input independent set. So if it is, then we add this informative vertex to our signature, but we, now we do something you know, very important. We enlarge our hypergraph. We keep all the edges that were there, but now we can also add the link of VI into H, meaning every edge of the hypergraph which contained VI we can replace it with a smaller edge that doesn't have VI because we know that our set contains VI. So if every independent set that contains VI will also be independent in the link graph. And let me use the following notation. It's the partial VI of HI, kind of some explanation of the notation. If you consider the hypergraph to be as a polynomial, then this is precisely the operation of taking a link graph. You take the partial derivative in the variable that corresponds to VI. You just eliminate, and it kind of disregards all the other edges. And if this monomial contains VI, it just removes it and replaces it with the monomial corresponding to the edge in the link graph. And otherwise, Uh, let's set SI plus, so otherwise just do nothing. I mean, propagate the current data, uh, but in both cases, uh, what we can do is, well, uh, this vertex VI is already processed. We already learned if it's there or not, so we remove it from AI. Uh, so in the final step of the algorithm, uh, so it's at some point we will have to stop because each time I increases by one, we reduce the size of AI. In the end, it will be the empty set. So we can set A to be the final uh, AI s to be the final si and what will be c these are all the vertices 
in the final A that can still appear, meaning the probability that V is in AP, given that AP is independent in the final hypergraph HJ, uh, this is positive. Yes. And step A is the is the conditioning also ah, of course. Thank you. Yeah, the conditioning is on HI. Thank you. So uh, kind of a thought exercise. These V are precisely the ones so that the singleton of V is not in HJ. Of course, if the singleton of V is an edge of HA, then the probability, this protein is zero. And if it's not, then this set has some tiny probability that it's just the singleton of V, and then it will be independent. So the probability uh, will be greater than zero. So kind of C are all this the vertices in this final A that by themselves, the singletons of them are not hyper edges in HJ. Because of course, if we, when we're taking consecutive link graphs, then the edges were getting smaller and smaller. And I mean, maybe some of them have, have size one. What if you said this, but I just want to make sure. So in the step B, when you change HI, then what exactly are you doing to HI? What is this notation? Ah, this is the link, the link of VI and HI. So these are kind of, so I'll write it formally. These are all the edges of the form a minus vi such that a is an edge of hi that contains vi but you also kept the original edges that uh, uh, yes formally yes. formally yes just okay of course they're not important anymore only the minimal ones are important but but just for kind of for the ease of uh, okay. simplicity of notation So this is basically, this is the proof. We just need to make sure that the sets we created have the requested properties. And it's not terribly difficult to, uh, to verify. Let, let me use the, the large board. So let me start with some easy properties. Uh, A is that uh, the size of AI always decreases. So this means that uh, the algorithm uh, always terminates. B S is a subset of I. Right? We only ever add things to, to S if, if they're in I. And C is that C can be reconstructed. with the knowledge of S only. Why? Simply because whenever we make a decision, so this B and C kind of are the only branching points in the algorithm and Whenever we use the fact that VI is in I, we put it in S. So if instead of the input I, I 
gave it the input s, we would kind of we would get the same s and the same c. So just if you replace this, it does vi belong to s, you get exactly the same execution of the algorithm. So what is there to show suffices to show? Okay. Three things that S is small, that I is in S union C, and that the probability Okay, that S union, a P random subset of C is independent in the original hypergraph is at least one minus P to the uh, power delta C. So these three properties are proved in a sequence of three lemmas, Not, none of them. Uh, terribly difficult, but the final lemma kind of will use a curious fact uh, about uh, product distributions and decreasing families that could be of independent interest. If we have two proofs of this fact, and Marcelo wrote to me a few days ago that he thinks it follows from some edge isoperimetric inequality in the hypercube, but unfortunately, yeah, I, I, we haven't had yet the time to, to really verify it. So here's lemma one. It, it says that for all i, si is in i is in si union a i, and two, uh, what are the independent set in h i? These are precisely those i prime such that when you add SI, you'll get something which is independent in the original hypergraph. So this is clear. Now, why is this clear? Well, if a vertex VI is not in I, then we just kick it out from AI. And if it is in I, then we move it over from AI to SI. Uh, this is maybe takes a, a little more thought. It's clear that it's kind of proven, of course, by induction on I. Uh, it's clear that C preserves it because we don't change H and we don't change S. Why is it preserved by B? Uh, well, simply because if you add VI to S, then you change I by replacing it by this hypergraph plus its link. And precisely this is the effect. So if you want to be kind of independent in, in the new graph, uh, uh, then it means you're independent in the old graph. Uh, but also, since you do insist that this vertex is there, you also need to be independent in the link. So I'm, I'm sorry that I'm kind of uh, waving the hands here. Uh, it's something you can check yourself, but I don't want to uh, to to run uh, run over. Them. And but let's prove a corollary of this is that S is in I, between I and S union C. So what we do know is that S is between I and S union A. This we do know just from the lemma. But we did remove some stuff from C, namely, uh, we removed all the vertices that have now zero probability to be independent. Uh, however, 
Now, if we have some vertex V, uh, which is in I minus S, which is a subset of A, uh, then the probability that V is in AP, given that AP is an independent set in HJ, this is the condition that we want to show that this probability is positive, and then we will have it to see. And where this is at least the probability that V is in AP and AP is an independent set in AJ. But this is at least the probability that AP is equal to I minus S. And this is strictly positive. And why is I minus S independent here? Because I minus S union S is independent in the original. So this is the probability that A, sorry, I minus S union, sorry, not the probability, but rather A because I minus S union S is independent in the original hybrid. Okay, lemma two. Maybe the most interesting is that delta S is at most PV, or in other words, the set S is small. And this has to do, I kind of, I think this is maybe the main uh, idea here. Why did we choose uh, to ask about, to consider this specific vertex? This would relate to the upper bound of the probability. Uh, so recall that AI plus one is AI without VI. And what is the probability that VI is in AI P random subset, which is uh, independent in HI. So we're looking at kind of the non-conditional version of this probability. Well, it's the same, it's P for this probability times the probability that AI plus one P is independent in HI union this link graph. Because if we are independent here and contain VI, then we also need to be independent in the link and independent in the original graph. So now two cases, if VI is in I, it does H I plus one is precisely H I plus the link graph. It, then uh, the condition for considering V I says that uh, this probability is at most one minus Delta times P times the probability that AI plus one, sorry, that AI is in an independent set in HI. This is by, by our choice. 
So the times that we do insert a vertex into S, uh, then the probability this AI plus one P is an independent setting HI plus one, this drops by a factor of one minus delta. This is precisely why, why we chose this vertex. So we have the set AI has some probability to be independent in AI, AIP. And uh, if we choose this vertex and modify this hypergraph, this probability will draw by a factor of one minus delta. <clears throat> and kind of the idea is that <clears throat> if we do it uh, too many times, then we, we would shrink the, the universe of sets to consider too much, but there is some lower bound on it because we can always take the empty set. So we cannot shrink it by a factor of one minus delta more than PV over delta times, because maybe we started with probability one. If we each time shrink by one minus delta, we are lower bounded by one minus P to the V, which is the probability of being empty. And uh, kind of formally, if VI is not in I uh, and thus uh, HI plus one is HI, then the probability that AI P is an independent set in HI uh, is at least the probability that VI is not in AIP and AIP is an independent set in HI. However, this is equal to one minus P for this times the probability that AI plus one P is not an independent set in HI, which is to say this AI, HI plus one. So here we gain a factor of one minus delta, and here we lose something, but not more than one over one minus V. And therefore, in the final step, when we consider the probability that AP is an independent set in HJ, well, it's at, more, at least the probability that it's empty. The empty set is always independent. However, it's at most, it's one minus delta every time we added something to S and perhaps we lost a factor of one minus P in the remaining steps, which is V minus A plus S. So this cancels that, and we get that one minus delta to the S, is at least a one minus P to the V. So this is a, an upper bound on S and the upper bound that can be derived is rough, is, is this. So this is roughly E two minus Delta S this is roughly e2 minus pv, so it gives an inequality between delta times s and, and p times v, and this can be made rigorous by looking at monotonicity of function, maybe one minus x to the power of one over x.
but <clears throat> the main idea is the way the vertex was chosen, since it's somewhat unlikely to be in a random independent set, if it is, then the universe that we're considering shrinks at a factor of one minus delta. So it cannot shrink too, too much because we always have the empty set remaining. Yes. What happened with the S there? Like one over one minus P to the power S? Ah, uh, we just ignored it. Because then, um, right, I could write here V minus S, so we get a stronger bound. But it's, oh, it's a plus. It's a plus, so it's V of. I mean, it's okay. It will be lower order. Lower order, yes. I think it's supposed to be a minus. It's supposed to be a minus, I think, yes. Yeah, because right, because we get, yeah, right, right, it's supposed to be a minus. Because for the for those S, we get this, and yes, uh, thanks, Matia. Okay, and the final lemma is, <laughs> and yeah, I, this will, this will end the, the, the torture that <laughs> kind of forcing so much calculation on you in the morning uh, was, is uh, what do we learn about the final set C? Well, you stop the algorithm at this point. This is not satisfied for any vertex. What does it mean? So if a vertex has zero probability from appearing in a random independent set, we'll just remove it. It's not interesting. But if it doesn't have a zero probability of appearing, it, the probability that it appears is somewhat large. It's at least one minus delta times P. And kind of this is a curious fact uh, about uh, product distributions. So uh, this here's a proposition that implies implies the, a lower bound on the probability that CP is independent. Suppose that C is finite and let I be some family of subsets of C which is decreasing and uh, let P be a probability between zero and one. Now, the logarithm of the probability that a P random subset of C is in I uh, can be lower bounded as follows. Well, it's log one minus P. And here we will write, it's the distance of the expected. So we'll look at the expected size of C, P, conditioned on being in I. So expected size of a C, P, conditioned on the fact that CP is an I. If this would be equal to CP, then each uh, element, even conditioning on being in this uh, small family, would still have probability P appearing. And actually this implies that the probability that you're independent must be one. And uh, kind of more generally, you can bound lower bound this probability by how far this expectation is from CP. So if every element has probability of appearing to be one minus delta times P, then this expectation is at least as large as C times one minus delta times P. So this uh, ratio is one minus delta, at least one minus delta C, which means that uh, this is um, 
at most delta times C. So we get a lower bound on the probability, which is at least um, one minus P to the power delta C. So maybe you know, if, if this is at least one minus delta PC, which is the case here, because it's true actually element by element, then this probability is at least one minus P to the delta C. Note that this is sharp. Wait, did you mean at most? At least, it's no, you're likely to be independent. It's log one minus p. So it's negative. The log is negative. Yeah, the log is negative. Yeah. So note that this is sharp because my family could be just the subset of some c prime. C prime is a subset of C. And then this actually holds with equality because you just need to, it will be one minus P to, to the power C minus C prime. And it kind of matches, it matches the Lord. So kind of this proposition Plus the fact that every vertex remaining has this one equal to reversed uh, gives the uh, the last condition, namely the fact that the final sets that we obtain are quite likely to be independent. Okay, I think I'll uh, I'll stop uh, talking here. I think I've already abused your hospitality, so uh, let me stop here. Questions? Why is the proposition true? Why is the proposition uh, good? Uh, so we have two, uh, kind of, we found two proofs of it. Uh, one is using the Kruskal Katona theorem. Uh, kind of, the, you can write the, this probability as um, it's proportional to the uh, kind of partition function. Of, of the hardcore model, if you're, fam if you're familiar with the model. So basically you want to maximize the partition function given uh, some value of the expectation because you don't want the expect kind of you've set the expectation and then you want to say how large can this probability be or sorry, how small can it be? And, and you could kind of move the weight down from large sets to small sets uh, however, the fact that the family is decreasing gives you some restrictions about how many small versus how many large sets you have. So Kruskal Katana tells you that the number of small sets in some sense to be at least as large as some function of the number of large sets. So this is this is one proof, kind of it's pretty direct, but it uses the Kruskal Katana. There's also another proof which uses the convexity of, uh, of relative entropy. With such probabilities, the log probabilities are kind of naturally written as the relative entropy of the condition distribution from the product distribution. And there's something called the chain rule for relative entropies, which is a generalization of the chain rule for entropies. And this is, allows you to estimate this probability by uh, just looking at the probability of appearance of any given vertex. And possibly there's a third proof uh, using some edge isoperimetry in the hypercube. Uh, so if I understand correctly, the container method can save you uh, union bounds, which of course is uh, crucial in many applications. So do you have a, a rule, an idea, a general idea? how to identify those union bounds for which the container method may be a useful tool. So I have a problem for mm -hmm. the container method apply. <laughs> so I guess kind of two features that are necessary 
you need to look at some global property kind of because th these error probabilities are just sub exponentially small in the expected kind of size of the universe so you need to look at global properties and the second thing is that the kind of constraints that define your problem should be of of bounded size or size which doesn't grow too uh, too fast with the size of the universe so kind of the important thing for triangle free graphs is that they it's it's three on the four. You mentioned about uh, computation, like how computationally heavy it is. So, the proof is here. What we're actually this this step. So estimating estimating kind of marginal probabilities. For vertices in the, in, in high, the hard score model, I'm not sure if it's. Mm -hmm. Is there a version in which, like, or maybe something weaker, like because, I mean, Or had Or Zamir had recently some nice results using TCS using container method. Uh, so, is there some version which you can? So for the, the previous proofs were co computationally much more efficient. Yes. But kind of mathematically, they were less efficient, and also the graph container. Kind of, if if your hyper if your hypergraph is one uniform, then it's trivial. If 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 for graphs, it's easy, and starting from uniformity three, it's it's becoming more difficult. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>